So we're beginning our study of arrays and array lists. Um, so the first thing we need to do is talk about what they are. Um, basically, an array is a list. It's an indexed list of elements. And we keep our lists organized with indexes. So all indexes start at zero and they go up sequentially. And you can create arrays of different sizes and we'll talk about that later. Um, but all arrays and array lists, as you'll see later, start with an index of zero and go up by ones. So they're just like strings, which we've just finished studying. In fact, I mentioned in the lecture that a string is an array of char values. So you'll see a lot of similarities between arrays and strings. Um, one thing about arrays is they can hold any kind of data type, but they can only hold the one kind of data type. So in this example that I've kind of shown here in this PowerPoint, this is an array of double values. And you'll see that each location holds a double value. Um, and all arrays are like that. You say what kind of data it's going to hold. You say how big the array is going to be. And then from then on, you can use it pretty dynamically as, as, as you see fit. And we'll go over the rules for arrays uh, in the next few slides. So you want to think of an array as being a list of variables. You already know the rules for primitive variables and how they behave and how that's slightly different from the way that object variables behave. And the rules are the same for arrays. So for example, when we create an array of int values, as I have up here, what we see is that the, ver the values for these ints, int values are stored directly in the array. So if I go into the five index of the array, the number 82 is stored right there in the array. The value of 83 is stored right here in the 7 index. And this is true for all primitive data. So if this was an array of booleans, the true and falses would be stored right in the array. If this was an array of char values, the char values would be stored right in the array. This is just like the rules for primitive variables that we've already talked about. Conversely, if we try to store an array, uh, if we try to have an array of objects, what we have to have is an array of pointers to the objects. And that's because objects have all different kinds of sizes, right? This string could be uh, you know, a full sentence or a paragraph or an entire book long. And so you know, Java doesn't know how big these objects are going to be. Their values can mutate. And so in order to keep the array organized, it keeps the memory addresses stored in the array and then the actual data is stored elsewhere. So in this example, the zero index holds a memory address for the string red. The one index holds the memory address for the string blue. Two holds the memory address for the string green and so on. Um, and this is the same as the object variables that we've already studied. So this shouldn't be that different. If you think of an array as simply a list of variables, then all the rules for arrays are the same as the rules that we've already studied for other kinds of uh, variables. So this is what the code for creating a brand new array looks like. You'll see that basically you specify what kind of data the array is going to hold. In this case, in this top case, it's an int array. And then you use square brackets. Every time you see square brackets, you know you're talking about an array. So we're saying this is an int array. Um, and you can do this with any kind of data type. And you'll see a few examples later on, but you can do it with any kind of primitive, any kind of object. Um, the square brackets specify that it's in a, a whole array of this kind of, of data, not just a single variable. And then you declare your variable name just as you would anything else. Right? This is an ordinary variable name. Equal sign. I'm assigning it to become a new int array. This is a little different. Arrays are objects, but they are very, very special kinds of objects. Uh, Java kind of manages the manages the array automatically in many respects. So we have a special syntax for creating new arrays. You basically copy what we have over here. You specify again the data type that is going to be held in the array and you specify what, how many 
uh, items the array can store. In other words, you specify the initial length of the array. And this can never change. Once you create an array, its length is always the same. If you want to lengthen it, basically you have to create a whole new array and copy all the values over. And this should sound familiar, right? This is the same rule as strings. Remember we talked about strings being immutable. And you couldn't, you can't change a string once it's created. You have to uh, basically create a whole new string adding on to the end. So the, the rules for arrays are similar to, the, to, uh, to a string. The only difference is that in an array you can come in and change the values in the middle of the array. The only thing that you cannot change is the initial length. Um, notice that this is saying I want to be able to store 10 elements and that means that the last legal index is 9 and that's because we start at 0. So this is the code that you'll type up here at the top and then in your brain this is what you think of as happening right you have a variable and it points to the array of int values and notice when I create an array like this it automatically gives the default value for that particular data type to every single uh, element in the array the default value for ints is zero and so every single uh, location in the array is assigned a value of zero. If you know a, a bunch of specific starting values for your array, you can create an array with starting values with the syntax that we here, have here down in the second bullet. Notice that we're declaring the variable in the same way that we did above. I'm saying I'd like to create a variable that will represent an array of int values, please. Then you create that variable then you write an equal sign and then we use curly brackets to show a set of integers okay and as long as this is a legal set of integers this will work notice that we're not specifying the length because the length is implied by the number of integers that we write there are five integers here so Java will create an array of five integers and plug in these as the initial values so these two do essentially the same thing. They both create an array variable and an array object. The bottom syntax simply gives specific values and the top index applies the default values. So this is an example of the exact same thing that we showed, saw in the last slide, except this time we're creating an array of object values, not primitive values. When I create in this, so let's take a look. So in the top bullet, I'm creating a variable that will represent an array of complex number objects. I'm calling it nums. And I am assigning it a new array of complex number objects whose length will always be 10. Java then immediately goes in and has nums point to an array of object values although we can only hold complex number objects in this array and it gives each the default value for object variables and if you remember the default value for any object variable is null so it kind of zeroes out all of these memory locations and none of these hold pointers to real life objects yet we can create an array of complex number objects that point to specific complex numbers although it's a little tricky for us right now again the left side is the same I say please create a variable that can represent an array of complex number objects and then I get I create a legal variable name and then I write the equal sign because I'm going to assign this variable and then curly braces say here is the set of new objects that I'm going to create. Actually, they don't have to be new objects. I shouldn't have said that. The set of objects. And in this case, I create three new complex number objects. If you remember, this is from the lab we did in Unit 2. And we created a constructor for complex number objects that took two uh, double values as parameters. These are ints, but Java will convert them automatically to doubles and I separate each one by a comma and this is I'm lying a little bit here <laughs> actually what is stored in these indexes are the memory addresses for those variables for those objects I should say 
but uh, I didn't have enough room on this PowerPoint slide. So please understand that what's stored in the zero index is the memory address for the complex number object representing 1 plus 2i. Memory address for 3 plus 4i. And the memory address for 5 plus 6i. Um, the next slide, this is showing you that array variables are object variables. They operate the same way. They point to the actual array in memory. And therefore, if my int array variable represents an array of integers and an int array also is an array of int variables, if I have one point to the other, this is a legal assignment and it will leave the value that my int array used to point to lost in memory and eventually the Java garbage collector will clean it up if, if nothing is pointing to it and both of these variables will point to the same array and that means if I go in and I make a change to one of these variables it will implicitly change the other variable because both are pointing to the exact same array in memory okay so now we want to talk about how do we actually access individual values in the array how do we change them how do we get things out of them and it's really very easy um, the trick is that you just always put the index that you are accessing or changing in the square brackets so square brackets always contain the index that you're accessing so in this case if we take this array my int array that I created earlier if you remember it was uh, 10 integers long and it was filled with zeros I can go in and I can say well set the zero index to become 13 and you can see that basically this acts just like an ordinary variable right my int array zero is just like you know this could be uh, xval or something some int variable that I created and I'm assigning it a value of 13 similarly here this is just like a variable go find the four index and assign it a value of negative three and this is what the array would look like after you executed those two commands so you can think of these again the index goes in the square brackets and you think of it then just as if it's an ordinary variable so if I go to the next slide we can do the same thing we can just say hey what's in a particular index so here I'm saying system dot out print line whatever is in the three index of the names array and again I'm using this just like any other ordinary variable um, and this is going to print out Mary because in the three index we see Mary uh, system data print line whatever is in the zero index and that's going to print Ron now again this is I'm being lazy here remember that objects are not really directly stored in the array this would be the memory address for Ron this would be the memory address for Ella and so on these are memory addresses but Java will go and uh, access the value at the memory address just like ordinary object variables that's how object variables work as we've already learned so if I go on uh, one thing that we have to do a lot in arrays is uh, go in and visit every element one time we call this a traversal so you'll see hear this word in computer science a lot traversing uh, and so that means you want to visit every single element one time common way to do that is to start at index 0 and move forward so for loops go together with arrays like peanut butter and jelly like a hand in a glove they are bound together forever I think um, one thing that you want to pay attention to and this is very interesting it's one of the only times that this happens but arrays actually have a public instance variable length so length is not a method it is for strings if you remember when we ask how long a string is we have to put parentheses at the end because we are uh, calling a method when you do it with arrays you are accessing an instance variable and the reason they did that is because arrays lengths cannot be changed they are forever permanent and therefore there is no danger of the length variable being accidentally changed to something dangerous it's just completely impossible so the Java people decided to make it a public instance variable. It is the exception that proves the rule, though. You should still always, always, always make your instance variables private. Um, so getting back to traversing. So in this case, we are starting our int index. 
Again, we're creating an int. I'm calling it index because it will always represent an index in the array. You want to start it at zero because zero is the first index. And I'm going to plus plus index after each execution inside the array. And I want to re-enter the for loop as long as index is still less than length. And then here I just have system.outprint r. And again, I'm putting the index inside the square brackets. So I am accessing the index th value of the array. And here I'm just putting on a couple spaces afterwards to make it look pretty. But this will print up every single value in the array. If r is an array of objects, this will call the toString method for those objects. And so we will be printing up the result of the toString method for each object. Now let's imagine that we are supposed to go in and change values, every single value in an array. This is still a traversal, but we're traversing and modifying every single value in the array. So notice the for loop is totally identical, right? The for loop up here, int index equals zero. Index is less than r dot length index plus plus. Exactly the same thing as we have here, because we're still traversing the array. We're still looking at every single index. We're just doing something different. So in this case, we're going into the r array at the index location, and I am doubling it. I'm multiplying that value uh, by two. We're presuming in this case that r is an index of int values or double values, but this would modify the array. We double each value in the array. So here's another example. Imagine that we're in math class and we're trying to create a table of function values. So imagine that like f of x is 3x squared minus 5, and we want to see what the values for that function are for values of x starting at 0 and going up uh, for however long this array is. Well, we can create a for loop. Here I'm creating a slightly smaller index counter. I'm just calling it i. I'm starting it at 0. Once again, i is always smaller than r dot length. And then I'm saying i++. plus plus. Remember that length is one more than the last allowable index, and therefore i should always be smaller than length and never be equal to length. So I'm going into the ith location of the array, and I'm simply setting it to be 3 times the index times the index minus 5. Again, this is because we're assuming that the array is a function, right? So if I plug in 3 for x, that means when i is 3, I want to plug in 3 for the x value, and so this comes out nicely. Um, and do remember that in an array, this is, arrays are just lists of variables, and so when you make an assignment like this, whatever used to be in this array location is completely gone forever. All right, is totally deleted. So if you wanted it for something, you should go take that, you know, make a copy of that value before we copy over with a new value. Okay, so we should start talking about how to actually solve some problems with arrays. And I'm gonna assign this kind of like for homework. Uh, so try to come up with your own uh, little loop that will reverse an array. And there's a little trick that you might fall into, but we'll talk about it at the beginning of class tomorrow. If you want a challenge, try to write a little loop, uh, maybe a couple of loops, that will remove the zeros from an existing array of int values. Um, in both of these, you can assume that the array already exists. You can assume it's a very, you know, it's called ARR or something like that. Um, remove zeros is kind of tricky, but go ahead and give it a try, and we'll start tomorrow's class by going over these answers, okay? Good luck. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.